Uh, thank you. I want to thank the organizers for having the chance to come to Australia. Well, I'm actually based in Australia um, to talk to you guys about the silicon approach, in particular about photonics. Um, we've heard a lot about other approaches, but today I want to focus on the approach that we're following at um, at SciQuantum. So I just wanted to start with a with a comment. So I'm I'm actually from Cairns, and you might not know this, but Cairns actually has the highest number of startups per capita of any Queensland city. So what I haven't heard at this conference is the idea of moving all of the quantum centers to Cairns. I think you should really consider it. I tried it on with our CEO, and uh, he uh, was not very receptive. Um, but maybe, I, I, uh, perhaps it's something to, to consider. Um, so the four founders of SciQuantum, the only thing I want to mention is that two of them are Australian. Um, and so Australia is very close to the heart of SciQuantum, and, um, and there's actually quite a few of us who are working remotely from Australia. And so who else is SciQuantum? So just very briefly, we're about 150 people. We've raised close to uh, about a billion Australian dollars, and we've got about 200 patents uh, disclosed. We've been around for about five or six years, and just there listed is some of the companies that have invested in us. And the one thing I want to highlight is that one of our investors is Microsoft, and that you did hear today about their exciting approach. Um, so what's SciQuantum's mission? So our mission is to build the world's first useful quantum computing uh, using photonics. Um, so what does this mean? So I want to first focus on photonics. And so this slide is pretty noisy. There's quite a lot of content. But I think the key thing about photonics that, that distinguishes it from the other fields is that using photonics, our, our, our qubit carrier is about kind of 200 terahertz in energy. And so that means it doesn't feel any noise at room temperature. More specifically is that when you have a single photon, the like phonon cross-section is incredibly small. And so that basically you don't interact with the environment. Um, second, it's scalable. And so we heard today about the challenges just then from IBM, that when you reach the number of qubits that you can fit on a single chip, it's then difficult to interconnect them. And so in silicon, because you begin in photonics, there's no need for transduction. So getting our quantum in information from one chip to another is, is, is effectively a much simpler problem than in the other approaches. Um, and also, it's more scalable because our, we require cryogenics, but we don't require um, sub millikelvin temperatures. Um, the other approach is that it's man manufacturable, and I'll touch on that in just a moment. Um, the second point I'd want to kind of highlight is the part of this thing that says useful. Um, so very fortunately, um, I don't have to spend much time on this slide because the panel yesterday discussed it in detail. But we're really focusing on an error-corrected quantum computer. And what does that mean more specifically? And so now there's this plot where the y-axis is some measure of the kind of computational size. So this is the number of qubits times by the number of t-gates. The reason we use t-gates is because t-gates are very expensive. So it's a good metric to understanding like how expensive a computation is. On the, on the x-axis is the number of years. And so what I'm showing on this plot is a bunch of algorithms. So here we've got RSA. And basically what's happening in the community is that how expensive it is to do RSA is coming down every, like, over time because people are understanding how to do it more efficiently. Also on here, I've got like catalyst and chemistry and kind of derivative pricing. Um, and what I'm showing in these horizontal lines is what I'm calling P1. And that's, how, that's what we're aiming to build, this product. And so what you can see is over time that these uh, quantum algorithms, their run times are coming within reach of what we're aiming to build. Um, and this is so the reduction in kind of gate count and runtime is something that SciQuantum is also contributing to. So in 20 minutes, I cannot fully satisfy the appetite of this audience with technical detail. I'm not going to try to do that. Instead, what I'm going to try to do is kind of advertise what we need to build a useful quantum computer using photonics. Um, so I'm going to focus on a fault-tolerant architecture, a manufacturable technology, and then dive into two details to hope to like satisfy some technical details um, for this audience. So first off, um, what is the fault tolerant architecture that we're pursuing at SciQuantum? Um, so what this slide is showing here is time on the x-axis. And it's really just kind of a very brief history of the architecture of photonics. So in the late 90s, it was really believed that an optical quantum computer was considered impossible. And then in the early 2000s, there, there was a result that said, yes, um, like this is actually possible, but the, but the architecture was very impractical. Um, then from then over the next kind of like 15 years or so, the experiments got better and better. But the thing I want to I highlight is that that dot 
seconds from the left, uh, which was when a practical architecture was published. Um, and so that's this paper. So this paper is a PRL from like 2015, and I was an academic when this paper was published, and I remember reading this paper and being like, this is a genius idea. There was a lot of things wrong in this paper. Like you read the paper and you're like, oh, this is like, there's many unanswered questions, but the, the root of this paper is like very key to the fault tolerant approach that we're considering at Cyquantum. And so I think it's fair to say that that paper um, was just a concept. So this is fantastic paper, this PRL. And then Cyquantum was founded. And over those five years, um, we've improved this concept. And I, now I think what we have is a practical blueprint about how to build a scalable quantum computer using photonics. And so very recently, over the last 12 months, we published a series of papers on the archive, which I encourage you to go and read and to study, which really highlight how we're going to do this using photonics, what the error models are, what the gate sets are, what the algorithms are, what, what the advantages are. It's all out there in these papers. So I encourage you, if you're a theorist, you could go and study fusion-based quantum computing, because this architecture is not just unique to photonics, it's naturally suited to photonics, but you can borrow these architectural ideas for the other platforms. So the key things that I want to highlight, because I cannot do justice of effectively about a team of about 50 people working for five years, that's effectively about 50 PhDs. I can't summarize that in one talk and, and give it any justice to what the team has been managing to do. But I think there are kind of four key points I want to get across and kind, of, and kind of advertise. One is that the architecture that we're pursuing is fixed depth. And what that means for people who don't study photonics is that we produce a, a, a photonic state, and then it only has to propagate through a fixed number of physical elements independent of the computation you want to do. So that's key. That means if you want to run a longer com computation, you just have to wait more time. You don't have to like, build a bigger and bigger quantum computer. Second is that we don't have to build incredibly large cluster states um, to do our computation. We only need to build very small scale kind of five or six qubit states. Um, and those, those are the resource states that we have to build and we have to build them well. But once we have those, then the rest of it that um, is just interconnecting those uh, with fiber. Um, the third point is this, this thing that we're calling interleaving. Um, and interleaving is just an idea about using some interesting kind of temporal multiplexing that can reduce the footprint of the, of the machine by about five or orders of magnitude. And so it really just brings this machine into being a way, way more realizable machine. And the last bit that I, that I can't really discuss in detail, but I want to highlight because I think this is very important is that the, the architecture is incredibly like, asymmetric. There are these things that we call inner qubits and these things that we call outer qubits. The inner qubits have a terrible life. We don't like them, we, they, they can die, they can see lots of components, but it's the outer qubits we care about. Those are the ones that we wanna have a very happy life and, and spend most of their, their kind of life just relaxing in, um, in fiber. And so what I've done here is a snippet from the very first archive paper, and I just wanna highlight one thing, which is this number here. 10.4%. And so basically the war cry of the architecture is we want a photon to be born, go through a bunch of elements and die, and for it to see less than 10% loss. And when I joined Cyquantum, I think that's a war cry that, that's, that, that's achievable. And so what do we use? We currently use uh, photonic qubits. Um, so what these are, very, very briefly to, to this audience who might, might not know, uh, we want to generate single photons, and the qubit is encoded in our scheme, and whether it's in the top or bottom, like in which spatial mode that it's encoded. So that's our qubit encoding. Um, because uh, if we lose a photon, it leaves the qubit subspace, and so we, we can identify when there's loss. So it's, it, it, it's a reasonable encoding uh, for identifying loss. Um, and as I said there, that we can handle about 10% loss um, with, with this encoding. Um, because we're encoded in photons, uh, we can really have pretty relaxed phase requirements um, because we use fusion me measurements, which only require coherence not um, within sub-wavelength. And we can do high-fidelity operations, which have been shown in kind of Jeremy O'Brien's research group um, um, before the company was founded. So the, the first thing that we need to do uh, to generate entanglement is that we need to generate small-scale entangled states. 
And so we do this using the kind of entangling gates that have been done uh, with bulk optics, but we're going to do them in an integrated platform. And then we generate these kind of three qubit entangled states. Um, so here I've shown like a three qubit GHZ state. Um, and then what we need to do is we need to do fusion measurements, which is for the experts kind of like a Hongo Mandel dip. And then if we do a fusion measurement, we can grow our entanglement. So here we have three, two, three GHZ states. And by doing fusion, we can now make this kind of four length chain. And then what you do is you start to build more and more fusions together. So you have another fusion and another fusion, and then you can start to build these resource states. So here we've got a, a, a kind of diamond state here, which is, our, which is kind of four qubits. And the key to the architecture is that whilst we have errors, whilst our fusions are non-deterministic and our photon sources might be non-deterministic, is that when they succeed, we know. And so the key to the architecture is the ability to multiplex. So by using switches, we can identify which of these things were successful and route those photons to the right place, and that allows us to boost our success probability. Um, and, and, and the key point is that with this and with these kind of like small scale fusion states, is that what you want to do is you want to generate this kind of large scale entanglement. And so one way that you could do that is you could tile a plane with these, RS, uh, these resource state generators, which are these kind of photonic modules. And then you can run them in time, and then you can fuse everything together. And then on top of this, you can do your error correction and your gate set. Um, and I don't have time to, to kind of discuss the details. But one key point I want to I wanna labor is that we've heard from multiple people here that the connectivity is, is a real problem. But in optics, we just need to be able to send our photons from one chip um, to another chip, and we can do that with fiber. But because our photons can go into fiber, fiber is a fantastic kind of quantum memory. It's not reconfigurable, but basically for about a kilometer of fiber, which is about kind of like on order microseconds, you only lose like a few percent of your light. And if you remember the 10% margin, you can imagine being in fiber and that, that kind of living within that margin. And so then the key of interleaving is that an observation from the kind of architecture team at PsyQuantum is that you don't actually need to have a two-dimensional plane of these resource state generators. If you're quite clever, you can do these different time length delays, and with a single resource state generator and three optical fiber delays, you can get one fully log logical qubit. And what this does is really reduce the size of the machine that we have to build. Um, so I want to switch gears, and I, and I admit that that was just a fly-through of uh, fusion-based quantum computing. Um, but I want to focus on now that silicon photonics is a nice manufacturable technology. And so, as was mentioned uh, by Xanadu yesterday, is that I think that one of the ways that you can build a million qubits is that you must le leverage the expertise in the semiconductor industry. And PsyQuantum has partnered with the Tier 1 Foundry um, to enable us to do this. Um, so we've partnered with, um, with global foundries. And so a picture that I've shown here um, is that any million qubit quantum computer is going to need lots and lots of modules. So we're going to be able to produce parts, produce wafers, and we're going to produce lots of them. It's going to be a big machine. And so in the picture here now, you've got a wafer. And on that wafer, as we zoom in, is, is some detectors. And we can produce these at scale. Um, and the key part of using this technology is that these are the best tools that we have on the planet. And so we want to be able to use the best tools so that we know that we're solving the problems that are at hand. We don't want to be solving the problems that are created because we're using the world's, not the world's best tools. And so another key part of targeting like a foundry is that how do we optimize the performance of our quantum computer? Where in the end, the levers that are available to you are the settings on the machines in the foundry. We want to know if you change this knob on this machine in the foundry, can we build a quantum computer or not? And to do that, you need to run a lot of material. It's an empirically driven uh, process. And so one thing that we've been able to do with our partnership with Global Foundries is by running lots and lots of material, we've been able to optimize yield, optimize performance, just like what you do if you're buying a laptop or a phone. And so in the last five minutes, I want to just talk about um, two things in a bit more detail. One is photon detection, and the other one is a system that we've built that we've called the Q1 system, and how we're doing full stack optimization, as was spoken about 
in the talk yesterday that how we design the architecture given the constraints of a full system. So how photon detection works in our machine is that you have a very thin superconducting film, and when you detect a photon, it changes the state from superconducting to normal. But unfortunately, this very thin wire, if it has a defect, it's not going to work very well. And so one of the things that wasn't in the past and in, in the community, these are made normally with e-beam lithography, and it's a very slow process. And what we wanted to do was scale this up and use the processes that are available within a foundry. And this, what this plot here is showing is in the top right um, is one of these wires. And if it's rough, it's just going to be bad. And so that's what you see on that kind of blue curve. So on the y-axis is the efficiency of that device. And on the x-axis is, is, is a bias current. And basically, what's important is that the, we get more like the yellow curve here so that we get a detector that's more about closer to kind of unit efficiency. Um, and the way that you do that is you want to have a very smooth wire. And so through our engagement with our, with our partner, we were designing these devices. So on the left there is a picture of the design of our detector. And on the right there is the result. And this is a, over like 500 process steps in a tier one foundry in the same process line where they build laptops. And so this detector here, so I'm, I, I don't like this plot because I think they could have chosen a, like a more pretty font. But the, what it's showing here on the, on the right is a distribution of measured devices. So we've produced tens of thousands, 50,000 of these detectors. And this is just one subset. This is just a single wafer. And what you see here is a distribution of devices. And we can detect these. We can screen for these. We can identify which devices are good and which devices are bad using inline testing. But what's critical is that all of them are yielding. And most of them are, are, are meeting our kind of parametric yield number as well for this device. And on the right, we're seeing wafer maps, which is showing that the change in the thickness of the film is changing by about a, na a nanometer. No, 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 the width is changing by a na nanometer, but the thickness is changing by less than an Armstrong. And those are the kind of process control that we need in order for this particular component to be good enough that we can hit that 10% loss target. So we're driving towards that 10% number. Um, so unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about the thing that I did at PsyQuantum. Um, so the thing that I did at PsyQuantum was help design and architect our Q1 system. And what this is, is an integrated system of electronics with detectors to optics with fibers, and it lives in a cryostat, and it does all of this stuff. And the reason why I want to throw this up is what's important is the co-optimization of this machine. That the power draw on the electronics, that, that the I.O. problem, the connectivity, the modularization is sufficient that we can build a scalable platform for a million qubits. So every part of this machine was not optimized to build this, this device, was optimized to ensure that everything that we're doing is scalable. If you just wanted to build what this machine did, you wouldn't do it like this. The reason we did it like this is because this is a stepping stone toward building many, many, many of them. This was packaged using professional packaging houses, using all of the vendors, and it's solving a lot of the I.O. problems that the other platforms are yet to solve. So the final last thing I want to say is that there's been a lot of talk of this company from software companies, uh, different parts of the stack, different parts of the ecosystem. So within PsyQuantum, we have algorithms, compilation, logical operations, fault tolerance, physical architecture, circuit design, systems, component design, manufacturing. We have the full stack. And what we're doing is we're optimizing every layer of this stack such that we can build a million qubit photonic quantum computer. And in order to do this, we have a, a huge model that goes from, like I said, if you change a knob in the foundry and the width of that detector wire changes, what does that mean with the threshold of the quantum computer? Does that change that 10% number from 10% to 12 or to 8%? So we translate from the things that the foundry cares about to whether or not we can build the quantum computer. And we're doing full stack optimization such that we're on the critical path to building the world's first quantum computer. And the reason that's important and what I've shown here is, is a cryo plant. And one of our VPs at our company is very, has done this his, his whole career. And basically, we want to understand the architecture because we want to understand how many of these we have to buy. And so we're very excited to have one of these in our hands in, in the near future. And with that, I want to thank you. 
and uh, want to say that we're hiring, so please reach out to us. And there's four other SciQuantum members in the audience. We've got Andrew Doherty, our former CTO, Jeff Pride, who spoke yesterday, and Sam Roberts and Chris Dawson, who are both quantum architects who can tell you more about the things I couldn't tell you about fusion-based quantum computing. Thank you.